Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Aneta, and I'm part of the events team at Honsby Library. Council recognizes the traditional owners of the lands of Honsby Sire, the Darug and Garingo peoples, and pays respect to their ancestors and elders, past and present, and to their heritage. We acknowledge and uphold their intrinsic connections and continuing relationships to country. This event is part of Honsby Sire Council's Seniors Week events. Now, have you ever wondered how to create an easy care garden? Well, today you will learn how to design and curate your garden so it's easier to look after. Moreover, have you ever wanted to help others by doing a little bit of gardening for them, but not sure if you're the right sort of volunteer? Well, easy care gardening are experts on both. And this talk will look at how you can get involved in volunteering gardening and how you can make life easier at your own place. Our presenter today is Meredith Kirton. Meredith is a well-respected author of seven gardening books, including Dig and Dig Deeper, which is exactly what we'll be doing today. <laughs> Meredith's talk will be followed by plenty of time of your questions to be answered. So over to you, Meredith. Hi, thanks very much. Um, and thank you for joining me in my lounge room, which is a very strange place to be gardening with you all today. <laughs> Um, I'm really thrilled to uh, be able to, first of all, talk to you about a little bit about easy care gardening and also talk to you about how you might be able to implement some of these techniques that we use um, to, to really make life yourself a little bit easier if you're gardening. Um, before I get started, I will tell you a little bit about myself more personally that you might not realise. Um, three years ago, I actually found out that I had rheumatoid arthritis and um, being a keen gardener in the past and always had, you know, a very able body, it came as a huge shock to me to not be able to do the things that I used to be able to do easily. So I guess it gave me real empathy to what most people that are older Australians live with daily and that is that their body just isn't what it used to be. <laughs> you know, and the garden that they created perhaps when they were in their 30s and 40s with a growing family may need some adaptation. Um, but my own, my own experience, I have um, actually a huge garden because I live on the mid-north coast as well and I have a, an acre garden. So you can imagine it, there was a fair amount of adjustment for me and a lot of perennial beds I've had to change and things like that. So I will talk a little bit about some of my own experiences um, as, I, as I go along. Um, the organisation itself is a charity, a registered charity, and um, we have hundreds of volunteers of people that not only live in the four local government areas where we operate, but that live in broader areas around Sydney as well. Um, and they come and garden simply for three hours once a week or sometimes they're just corporate days that they might join us on as one off. And um, they're put in teams in a nutshell and they go and work at somebody's house for three hours and transform what might be an overgrown jungle in that time back into a manageable state. Um, so I'm hopeful that we will talk about how to stop you getting into an overgrown jungle. But if you need to have call us, call us, that you'll also know how to get help. And if you think that you're the sort of person that might be able to put up your hand and help others as well, that that could be something that you might look at doing. So how to create an easy care garden? Well, I've been talking to our coordinators about this because if you approach easy care gardening to get some help, one of the first things that they do is actually come over to your garden and have a look around and work out where you've gone wrong or what can be done from now on to try and get it to be a little easier care. And um, I guess that sort of first step is taking stock of where you are now. 
So it might be something really, really simple to create an easy care garden, like reducing the actual size of the garden. So it might mean putting in some paved areas or graveling some sections, heaven forbid not concreting large sections of the garden, but, but reducing the actual size of your garden beds can be the most obvious but sometimes overlooked way of making an easier care garden. Um, one of the next really simple things that you can do is mulching. Now, um, people get confused with mulching because there's lots of different types of things that you can use for mulch. You could use wood chips, you can use pea straw, um, you know, you can use gravel. There's all sorts of things that mulch is. Basically, mulch is a seven centimetre layer, top, top layer that goes on top of the soil and it has different purposes. Its primary purpose is to suppress weed growth. Its secondary purposes might be to keep soil moisture constant or to gradually feed your garden. If you're trying to create an easy care garden, you might want to use a mulch that you don't have to replace often. So that could be something like, um, it could be just uh, gravel, or it could be something like wood chip or pine bark. Now, if you're going to put the mulch down first, you need to create a barrier so that the weeds don't automatically come up. Now, back in the 70s, it was popular to put down a layer of black plastic, um, but the the thinking these days is that that's really not good because A, the soil can't breathe and B, weeds still fall on the top and get then trapped on top of the black plastic. So most people these days don't even use woven plastic or weed control mat. Most people these days might use something that does break down, like Easy Care Gardening just uses old newspapers and that works really, really well. Putting thick layers of newspapers down, overlapping so that there was no room for um, you know, the wheat plants, the weeds to get in. Um, overlap, overlapping so you had a lovely tight knitted barrier. Um, a good three or four sheets deep and then mulching over the top with some wood chips. Now, if you're going to mulch over the top with wood chips, as I said, one of the mistakes people make is that they don't actually make it thick enough. Um, five to seven centimetres is about ideal. So that's quite thick. That's really a pointer finger deep. Um, it's much thicker than people imagine. And um, that will be the ideal kind of layer to blanket and stop weeds from coming up. Um, once you've mulched, um, it's much easier to keep the weeds down. And of course, using that newspaper method, you can go around the roots of plants that you wanted to keep. Um, so that's one of the first big things that we always do. Um, then the other tip that we always look at to make things easier is to really reduce the amount of pot plants that people have because they all need individual watering. So stick your pot plants that you really love and cherish to, to just a couple of high impact areas like on either side of the front door or just outside the back door where you're going to have no problem accessing it and also you're going to see all the time so you're going to see and constantly be reminded of what they might need in terms of whether they need watering or whether they need to feed but that will also be visually the most impactful places to put your pot. All the rest of the pots um, really should be planted as much as they can into the ground or combined into very big pots. So that's another really, really good tip is instead of having lots of small pots, um, get some really big containers and lash out and put them all in one. Now, when you're doing that, um, it's a great chance to sort of rearrange some of the combinations that you might have too. And a little tip with designing those combinations is to always imagine that your plant, your planter is in three parts. It's got what I like to call the thrill, so that's like the feature plant in the centre of the pot, the fill, 
and the spill, the something that, that's trailing down as well. So if you imagine your pot in those sort of three parts, the, the thrill, the fill and the spill and rearrange into bigger planters, you'll have a much more um, easy care kind of garden, but not only that, it will actually be much more impactful in terms of those containers. So always imagine bigger is better and you're okay. Um, so that, that's one of the tips. Now, one of the other things is to, sadly, um, is to keep plant varieties down to a minimum if you're trying to make your garden as easy care as possible. And that's because the more plants you have, the more individual needs there'll be, the more difficult it will be to prune. So if you've got something that is thriving and doing well, replicate it is another top tip. You know, it, don't think it's boring. Think it's better to be there than not be there and just replicate it. Um, the other thing is that nature really hates a vacuum and weeds and things are opportunist. So if you have space that's there empty, it will grow weeds. So instead of having, you know, just the ground cover, just the mulch, then re-look really at that about planting some, some massed ground covers and they will keep the weeds down for you because they itself will become an impenetrable layer. Now, um, my favourite, to be honest, um, I've got a few. I love a, a native violet for the shade and also dichondra or kidney weed that you can get as a silver variety or a green variety. They are both great gangbuster plants for, for um, a shady area. Um, but another tip is to go out and have a look at other gardens. And certainly, if you've got an old established garden with lots of trees and lots of shade, take a trip to the Botanic Gardens and have a walk around there and you'll see that they too have big trees with lots of shade and massed ground cover underneath it. And take a photo of those ground covers and if you don't know what they are, you can either show a, a, a horticulturalist in a nursery or you can download an app like something like iNaturalist and upload that picture and it will tell you what it is. Um, people around the world will, will contribute and actually help you identify your plants. Um, and then mass plant something like that, like, you know, as I said, something like native violets is great. In a sunny area, I mean, it, everybody's seen things like gazanias on mass, but grevilleas on mass are fantastic, or creeping boobiella and little native um, myoporum is another great option. And these are really vigorous plants that all root as they grow. So they actually send new, new roots down as they spread out. And by doing that, they, they form that really, really thick, thick um, barrier. I'll just have a look. I think I might have a few questions there. Um, can I get help from Easy Care by arranging for them to come in and see my garden? Okay, and does fertiliser and sea salt penetrate through the newspaper? And is sugarcane good to use? Okay, sorry, I should have seen those questions earlier. Um, okay, so in terms of the mulching, is sugarcane mulch good to use? Sugarcane is great to use if you're going to be um, using a vegetable garden or a perennial garden or an annual garden where you really want to feed it all the time because the actual sugar cane um, breaks down reasonably quickly and is high in nitrogen and will help feed your plants. So if you might have roses or something, it's great to use. If you might have, you know, vegetables, herbs, it's great to use. But because it's breaking down, releasing that nutrient into the soil, it's building up the soil, but it's going to need replacing very quickly. So yes, it's good to use, but it's not easy care. Easy care is something like your wood chip or your, um, you know, your, your pine flakes and things like that, or, or your uh, pine fines or your eucalyptus fines, because they will take much longer. And yes, Fertiliser does penetrate through the newspaper. Anything that's water-soluble will go through that 
through that newspaper. So yes, you don't need to be worried that you're creating a barrier that, that your liquid fertilisers can't get through because they're dissolved in the water and in fact, they'll get through as well. Um, can I get help from Easy Care by arranging them for them to come and see my garden? Um, the way you get help from Easy Care Gardening is um, actually through the My Aged Care site. So because it's a, an, an organisation that um, is funded by, by, the, aged, by the Commonwealth um, Government, they actually fund it, um, then you need to qualify through the My Aged Care website. So you can go on there and once you do qualify through that My, My Aged Care website, then yes, we send a coordinator over and the coordinator will look at your garden and work out what you need. And yes, there is a fee. It's a small fee, even though it's a volunteer service. Um, uh, and, the, and the fee varies depending on your situation. So in that hopefully answered that question. It's, it's, um, it's certainly much cheaper, <laughs> like hugely cheaper. It's an affordable service. And it's meant to be an affordable service. It's not a profit organisation. It's a not-for-profit organisation. Um, so I hope that that answers those questions. Sorry, I didn't see them earlier. Okay, so um, back back to the some of the tips. So yes, so ground covers are fantastic. Mulches is fantastic. With the actual garden design, try to keep your beds um, no small bitty beds always try to have larger beds that have got curved lines so that it's easy to mow next to and um, always try to have a garden edge so that the grass isn't growing into your garden bed um, because frankly grass is probably one of the biggest weeds that we are often pulling out and that's you know things like cooch runners and kikuyu runners that have got into your garden bed so having some good some good garden edge or a cutting edge um, that the lawnmower man can actually cut against is a really, really good good way of creating an easier care garden. None of those small bitty beds. Um, and, um, and always try to have as many low maintenance plants as possible. Now, they don't have to be native, but certainly if you're looking at plants that are native to your area, they're going to be much more low maintenance because they've evolved to be right for these conditions. So in Sydney, for example, where, where we all are, um, the sorts of plants that are really good at, at creating a low maintenance garden, I've mentioned some of the ground covers, but if you want to move up into sort of one metre high shrubs, you would be looking at small grevilleas, um, a lot of those lovely tropical grevilleas are repeat flowering. They'll flower for months and months and months of the year. Um, you might want to add some native grasses, so some things like lamandra grass or dianella. Um, they're terrific, not as a ground cover or a grass, but as a structural difference. So they'll give you some really nice textural contrast in the garden. Um, and certainly if you've got a full, full sun position, other natives like Beckias, um, Little Dwarf, Tea Trees are all fantastic and really low maintenance. Little, little Dwarf um, Bottle Brush are very, very low maintenance. But as I said, it doesn't have to be native. You can find really low maintenance other plants um, as well. So um, the ones that you're going to be trying to avoid are really your things like your azaleas that might need spraying or extra feeding. You're really going to try and avoid your roses that might need, again, extra spraying, extra feeding. But you could replace those with something like camellias, um, some of the lower dwarf ones, if you still wanted an exotic look, or raphaelipus, the Indian hawthorn, because they don't get any of the, any of the, you know, they don't get any of the fungal problems that azaleas get, and they certainly don't get any of the other pests and diseases. So it, 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 it can be a great balancing act of marrying um, natives in with exotics as well. I really I, um, don't understand why people feel that they have to have one or the other. There's, natives and exotics can work really, really well together. 
So certainly combining them, so you end up with some really interesting textural um, contrasts as well. Now, some of the other things you might want to look at, you know, in terms of rethinking what you already have. Um, sometimes people have got clipped hedges and they might be really tall. So um, instead of having them as a three metre clipped hedge, it may be looking at reducing them significantly. So maybe that they are a one metre hedge so that you can still easily get on top of them and keep them pruned. Um, if you can't do that, uh, it might be a matter of actually accepting that you need some help and asking if you've got a lawnmower man, whether he can do the hedges as well, because often they will be able to do that as well. But yes, always try to imagine, can I perhaps reduce the size of that plant and therefore it's easier for me to get around um, is always a good tip. Sometimes it's just a matter of accepting that the look is going to be slightly different. Um, other things that you might do is do a really heavy prune where if you're not able to do it, you can get someone to come in once a year and give a really, really heavy prune. And lots of plants will love that and respond really well. Um, I know it's often joked that it's a man prune, but if you do a man prune in August, just before the warm weather comes and reduce the plant by really a third to a half, it will mostly respond very well and grow back beautifully in that spring as soon as the weather is warmer and then you'll be able to be on top of it at a more manageable size. Um, some of the comments we get from some of our clients after we do, you know, after we might have done this sort of thing or been in and done some gardening and really transformed a jungle back into a manageable sort of space is, um, you know, they'll actually say that they'll be able to garden now and potter themselves because one of the things that can happen if you become overwhelmed is that you actually don't go into the garden again. You kind of turn your back around, uh, back to it and you pretend it's not there and you're not going out and enjoying it because it's too hard. Whereas when you have a service like Easy Care Gardening come in, and fix it for you, you regain control and access. And that's really important because it, it, it en enables our clients to actually be able to discover their garden again. Um, some of the other tricks that you can use, um, certainly raising your garden beds is a fantastic way of making them easier to have access to. So, um, you know, a bit of a redesign that way. If you're going to actually build raised garden beds, um, a wicking bed is a very useful design feature to make a raised garden bed. Now, what a wicking bed is, it's basically just creating a huge um, self-watering pot, for want of, want of a better word. Um, and, the, and the self watering pot in a wicking bed is just 15 millimetres of gravel at the base, but the whole um, your whole garden bed is actually lined in thick plastic first so that it holds the water. And then you put 15, 15 centimetres of gravel and a layer of um, fabric to stop the fabric from going, uh, to stop the, the soil from washing down into the gravel. And then you put your garden bed, your soil and things on top of that. And um, you have a pipe down the side. You can Google these wicking beds. Um, and a little overflow pipe and basically instead of the, the, the garden working that you're watering from the top down, it changes, it flips it on its head and it actually be so that your wicking bed will water from the bottom up. Um, the reason this is so good is that it's really water efficient and it does it itself with this, with this drawing the water up. So you might only need to top up your reservoir at the base um, sort of once a month even depending on the weather, um, rather than you know constantly going out and watering there. Now I see uh, I've got a question there about the trimming. Is all trimming mainly done in early spring? Um, it depends on what it is. Um, when I said August, if I'm if I'm going to do a hard prune on something like you know uh, 
an azalea or a maria or something like that that's one of those big tall shrubs that are you know fatinia or something that i might have been saying let's take it from three meters down you would do it at that time of the year if you were doing something that was spring flowering and you wanted your flowers then you wouldn't prune it at that time of the year because you would be removing its flowers you would instead be pruning it straight after its spring flowering um, and can I suggest a mass ground cover to reduce weeds? Um, yeah, so like I said, some of those, uh, a trip to your botanic garden, they've got a, the Sydney Botanic Gardens has actually got a, a little nursery, the Friends of the Botanic Gardens nursery that's attached to that. And they sell a lot of those ground covers there that they've actually got at the botanic garden underneath the trees. So that would be one thing I would do. Um, but can I suggest any? Yes, the dichondra is terrific. I've got that, um, the silver fall one under big, big established trees with huge root competition. Um, some of the, so that's terrific. Often, you know, um, just having bromeliads is a great solution. Mass planted underneath trees where there's a lot of shade cover um, and because they, they cope with the root competition really well. Um, but it does depend whether you've got that full sun position or or not. Um, and is there a secret for eradicating rhubarb vine? Uh, the secret is hard work, removing all the top part of the plant, obviously with a still timed rate to get the majority of the actual vegetation away. But then you'll also have to, after you've done that, you'll have to dig up all of those tubers, those potato-like tubers um, to remove those. And yes, as you get another crop of, of vegetative growth coming up, then you'll need to hit that with a herbicide or keep on digging it out. Is there any trick? I would say the trick is hard work. Um, sorry, that is not an... It, it, it's much easier to keep weeds out of a garden than it is to retro keep a garden, you know, go back and try to... Um, improve a garden that's been overtaken by weeds but don't let me that don't don't let me um, put you off if your garden has been overtaken with weeds and you qualify through my, my aged care I mean we've been to gardens where you open up the back door and you need a machete to get to the clothesline and we've regained those <laughs> so we'll be able to get yours as well too I'm sure um, yeah, so some of those, if you can, putting in raised bark garden beds is a really good option for terms of redesigning some features. Um, they don't have to be wicking beds, but even just raised garden beds to have them at a height that you can manage. Um, and also, back, um, you know, back decades ago, we used to think that digging gardens over was the best practice horticulturally. Now there's a lot of different thinking around that. Um, now they say instead of digging over gardens, you should only be adding things from the top so that you're not destroying the soil structure and let your, let your worms and your, and your soil organisms do the digging for you. So, you know, adding your nutrition, adding your organics over the top is much easier. Let's brace it. Much easier and it's better for your garden. Um, one of the other really big things about creating an easy care gardening is, of course, watering. So um, we've been blessed this season with buckets and buckets of rain, um, but we can all have memories just to last year, I'm sure, when it was much drier. Um, and in fact, we've been through some pretty bad droughts late, lately. So training your plants is a really key thing to having a more successful garden. Um, training them to be less dependent on your watering regime and to actually fend for themselves. So that is really a matter of, you know, if you used to go out every afternoon and water, cut that out completely, do it every second day, every third day, do it for a longer period of time and eventually you should be able to, you know, be watering once a week for a good, for, um, you know, half an hour at each area and then cut that out completely and your plants really should not need, your garden shouldn't need watering if they're mulched well enough. It should only be your pot plants that need the mulching. Um, 
yeah, so so um, I think I've got a few more questions there as well. No? No, sorry, I've got those. Okay. All right. Okay, so um, so some of the other things to creating an easy care gardening. Um, so use natives wherever you can. Create some more wide paths so you've got great access. So some lovely gravel paths or some lovely mulched paths. Both of those are really easy for you to get not only access but um, for you to be able to maintain. Um, always create more seating, I think, is a really important thing in the garden. Have a spot where once you're at the back, you can pop yourself down um, and take a breather. Um, or put your tools and, and not lose them in the garden. Having a little seat is a really good good way to do that. Um, replacing your lawn used to be a popular thing to, to say to do, but to be honest, I actually think that the lawn was much maligned for no reason. Um, as long as you're not overwatering your lawn or overfeeding your lawn, your lawn is is actually a really good way of lowering the temperature, the ambient temperature of, around your house um, and keeping your house cool. And it certainly is a great way of keeping weed, weeds down. So um, I wouldn't be ripping up your lawn. I would probably be increasing some of the areas of lawn to make sure that any of those little bitty garden beds were, were swallowed up. Um, yeah, with the, with the weeding, um, always make sure that you can do your weeding before plants go to seed. There's an old saying, one year's, um, one year seeding, seven years weeding, and it's true. So if you see something going to seed that's a weed, grab it before it does because you don't want all of those seeds going into your garden. Um, and if you, if, if you can't physically get, get them, then it might be a matter of um, tying bags over bunches of seeds and things like that so that you actually don't let them, um, you know, drop their seeds, even if you can't actually physically remove them. So that's another thing. So really, um, and that mulch will really help as well on, on keeping the weeds down. Now, some of the other things that you can look at is tools. So nowadays, technology can help. So um, you can... You can get apps for watering your garden. You can get robotic lawn mowers. Um, you can get pneumatic tools that are much easier on your hands. Um, you can get battery pack tools that are much lighter and, and more manageable to use. So having a look at some of the things that you're gardening with and making sure that you're using the kindest tools for you so that it's nothing is a strain is another, another thing. And then just gradually starting to um, remove plants that are really high maintenance. So removing any of your really high maintenance annuals and only having a couple of pots by the door or only using the herbs that you, only planting the herbs that you really do use and the vegetables that you really do use, keeping those annual things for the special things, replacing some of even the perennials um, that might need dividing up every few years, replacing them with you know, with with shrubs that are more permanent features of your garden gradually um, is another really good way of just easing some of the work. And of course, if you've got things like uh, grandkids that you can use, I many a time in my childhood was I bribed. <laughs> to do some of the hard work in my garden, in my parents' garden or in my grandparents' garden. And as long as you make it into a fun game, you know, everything, a competition, I think you can really get yourself some, some good help there pretty quickly and get some of those grunge jobs up. Um, but just changing your expectations as well is a really, is a really um, you know, key thing, I think. It doesn't have to be... Um, it doesn't have to be as neat and trim as it used to be. And in fact, it's probably more environmentally friendly for you to have things that may be a little bit wilder than you're used to. And you'll find that the birds and things come in and start doing some of the gardening for you. They'll start eating some of the grubs and things for you. Um, all right, so is there a place, I've got a question here, where garden tools 
can be sharpened or polished. Um, yes, yeah. so sometimes your, your local lawnmower repairman will do that. Um, sometimes, there, it depends where you are, but sometimes there's shops like um, the Bower that's in Marrickville, they will do that. There's a group in Lane Cove, Lane Cove Sustainability Action Group. There's a guy there that will do sharpening and polishing tools. Um, sometimes there's workshops held by various councils. Sometimes I've seen um, Parramatta Council have the Bow Group out there as little, as little um, sort of, you know, pop-up uh, days where you can go and get your um, tools sharpened. Sometimes nurseries do it. I've seen Eden now and again do that, but other nurseries do that too. So you've just got to be, yes, keep your eyes eyes peeled for that sort of thing. But yes, it can. And if your tools are sharpened and working well, it will be more efficient. Um, I've got a question here about any ideas to remove oxalis and suggest in remulching and seaweed. I find it easy to put down a sprinkle of bud and blown to stop the mulch using the existing nitrogen to uh, break down. Okay, so this person has said, um, I find it easy to put down a sprinkle of blood and bone to stop the mulch using the existing nitrogen in the garden to break down. I then make a seaweed water mix in my wheelbarrow cart and soak the mulch in it for about half an hour and distribute it over the garden. So what they were talking about, um, when they talk about nitrogen drawdown is um, some every every organic matter is on its process of decay some things decay faster so as I said some things like sugar cane decay faster and the reason they do that is that they're finer but also because they've got more nitrogen in them other things like chunky wood chips take much longer to break down um, and they, the, the organisms that break those things down use nitrogen to break down. So what this person is suggesting is by putting some blood and bone down on the ground first, um, it's stopping drawdown. Now drawdown is when um, they're taking nitrogen out of the soil to help break down the mulch. Um, it's, it's more a problem, to be honest, it's more a problem in things like potting mixes when the organic matter is combined through the soil, through the mix, but is not broken down properly. If you're using it as a mulch over the top, you shouldn't really, you're not trying to encourage it to break down. You're trying to encourage it to be a thick blanket layer to stop the weeds. Um, but certainly using seaweed solution, any kind of, any kind of um, liquid fertilizer, as I said, be it, you know, liquid blood and bone, liquid seaweed, anything is still going to percolate through the soil and um, into the, you know, into the soil where the plants can get it. Any ideas to remove oxalis? Um, okay, so oxalis, um, because it's got a bulb there um, under the ground, it really has to be done with a weedicide or digging out the whole batch of soil and hopefully getting all of the little bulbs in. Now, um, yeah, there's, there's no real way around that. So um, a lot of those annual weeds, you don't have to use a weed aside. You could use something like boiling water or even flames. You can get flame, flame weeders. But for anything that's got those perennial bulbs, because they'll keep on coming up, you really need to, to to use a weedicide that can be can draw that that poison back into the bulb, or you need to dig up the entire clot of soil and hopefully get all the bulbs in. So yes, I hope that's answered that question. Just one of the things I'd like to just finish on is is some of the health outcomes for gardening. Um, if you can join a team and be a volunteer. Uh, you'll get more out of it than, than, believe it or not, you'll be giving. Um, there's lots and lots of studies that show that gardening is exceptional for your health. It's not just a physical exercise. It's mentally brilliant at planning, 
Um, it's great for dementia, for you know, for helping stop you get dementia. Um, being in the sun is obviously great for your vitamin D and your endorphins and things as well. Um, but working in a team and helping others, that actual volunteerism part of it is a really, really great sense of satisfaction. At the end of three, out, three hours of volunteer gardening, you'll be, look at, your, look at the fantastic job that, you're t that the team's created, because you're often in a group of four or even eight people, so you get, done, you get heaps done and you get all the training that you need. And at the end of it, you look and look around and feel like you've really contributed. And I think that sort of sense of satisfaction and, the in, and also the interaction with the client um, and how you've changed, you know, you've really changed things for them and made their garden more accessible and what a wonderful thing change in, in their, their disposition has made. It's a, it's a great sense of um, well-being and job well done that you get yourself as well. Now, I've got a couple more questions. So... I'll just answer those. What areas of Sydney do you cover? Well, if you want to be a volunteer, you can volunteer anywhere. But if you want our services, you've got to be living in one of the four local government areas that we operate. And that is um, the City of Ryde, Hornsby Shire, Hunters Hill, or Karingai Council. So any of those areas, if you can, you can qualify through My Age Care, we're happy to come and service you. Um, but if you want to volunteer, just this morning, I was at Richmond with one of our volunteers who was getting a Seniors Award for his contribution to Easy Care Gardening. He had joined the organisation in 2006 as a volunteer and um, he comes down from Richmond twice a week. So you can come here from, we accept people from everywhere, <laughs> but unfortunately we can only operate in those four, four local government areas. Okay. Um, is there a similar um, organisation in other areas of Sydney and Western Sydney? Okay, so if you hop on our website, um, which is easycaregardening.com.au, there is a link there to other organisations that are like ours um, but uh, that operate in other areas of Sydney. So you might find your area there. Um, and you'll also see some stories on our website that have volunteer stories and client stories. So you can just get a better idea, I guess, of, of whether you think you might be either needing our services or whether you might be able to see someone that is um, able to volunteer. That is wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, Pleasure. Meredith. Okay, thank you. Wonderful. Okay, so no more questions. All right, thank you so much. And uh, we hope to uh, see you again in one of our workshops, possibly face Thanks. to face in the future. <laughs> yes, let's hope so. <laughs> Excellent, okay. lovely. Thank Bye -bye. you so much, everyone. Thank you, Meredith. Have a good afternoon.